Outdoor Secrets Unwrapped is brought to you in part by White Rocks Design Studio at Turcotte Design, who has been serving Southern Vermont for over 20 years. Fish Donkey, the future of tournament fishing. Targets Unlimited, Mercer Sports. Outdoor Secrets Unwrapped hot sauce with that big craft heat and that big craft taste. Corker Boots, P-Line, Sugar Mountain Trading Company. The Outdoor Experience Guide Service, who has been serving Southern Wisconsin for over 20 years. Cooler Guard Spray with the cleaning pot. Power of Enzymes, Okuma Fishing, Hoffman Lures Incorporated, and a proud member of the Southwest Chamber of Commerce. And boy, what a show we have today. So a few weeks ago, we were in uh, Pulaski, New York. Pulaski, New York. I got to say that right because they get all mad. It's not Pulaski, Pulaski. Uh, we stopped by the fish hatchery here. And I was like, God, what a great show we could have. And, and my buddy says to me, why don't we call and find out? So I did that. Had to go through a little bit of uh, a process to make it happen. But we are here at the Salmon River Fish Hatchery, and boy, what a show it's going to be because I just got a quick look at some stuff. Wait till you see it. Anyway, I'm going to wreck this guy's last name, but we're with Thomas, and you can say your last name. Kel Basinski. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this show. <laughs> You're welcome. You know, um, when I see fish hatcheries, I'm always like, well, we call them in Vermont, we call them uh, fish culture stations. That's fine. So... Uh, um, I always want to know, why do we have them? Like, what is the deal with this actual fish hatchery? Why do we have it? Well, this is one of the biggest fish hatcheries New York State runs. Um, and I think a lot of fish hatcheries maybe start out with a certain purpose and they morph over time. Um, that's one of the things that this hatchery, this hatchery supports the sport fisheries for Chinook salmon, coho salmon, steelhead trout, and, and brown trout okay. in Lake Ontario, and then to some, to some case, uh, uh, some extent, Lake Erie. Mm -hmm. So we provide the fish that provide the, the, the sport fishery for anglers that are, you know, uh, bank anglers, uh, river anglers, mm -hmm. uh, and, and also the charter captains that, that, that will sell you a charter to go out and catch these fish out in the main lake. So how long has the Salmon River Fish Hatchery been here? The hatchery started production around 1980, and um, there were lots of different experiments before that when stocking uh, Pacific salmon in the, in the, in the Lake, in Lake Ontario, um, mostly uh, following Michigan's uh, experiments to, to, to work on reducing the, the overabundant alewife population. Ah. And yeah. so they had the, a, 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 an opportunity to create this sport fishery that was really sought, for, sought after and also reduce the, the problems with uh, overabundant uh, alewife populations. So what are my, you, you guys got a beautiful center here and we'll talk about that in a minute. But um, one of my burning questions are, how do you know how many fish to raise? Okay. in this hatchery it's because i know you guys probably raise millions of fish throughout the state but this particular hatchery how do you know uh, i think we're gonna have uh seven million fish or whatever it is how do you come about so that? it's a collaborative effort because we have fish culturists that run fish culture stations or fish hatcheries okay and they take their cues from biologists that manage the fishery 
So the biologists, like Lake, uh, Lake Ontario is managed by not only other, a couple of different states, but also Canada as well. So we have ah. all these agreements with other places and we co they come together and they talk about how many fish they have. They do, Lake Ontario is one of the most studied lakes in the Northeast. They put a lot of time and energy mm -hmm. into understanding the, the prey base, the forage base, and the, and the populations of the predator fish. And they have a, 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 a model that they want to use to, what, you know, what do we want in the lake? The anglers decide how they want what they want, and they mm -hmm. and they so then they, their management plan is is based on what the anglers want. We raise the f species that the biologists feel work in the system, and so their quotas, we get quotas from them. They say, okay, in 2024 we're going to stock, and I'm not, yeah, you know, no, no, whatever, like, yeah. a, a million fish, right? And so then we have to figure out. We use science and we use historical data to find ah. out how much, how many eggs. We look at it. We say, how many eggs do we need to take to get to the end result to be a million fish? Wow. See, because when you talk to common Joe guy out on the on the lake, it's like. Oh, they never put enough in, or they never do, because they don't know what really, how the science is of it. Now, the other question is, you guys grab eggs, right? Um, how many, and you don't have to give me an exact number, but how many eggs does a female king have generally? Well, it depends on the size of the fish. Okay, and we could go into and, that. Yeah, and spe different species are, are, are larger when they're, you know, right. we, we do... We, we harvest eggs from large females and we harvest eggs from smaller females. So mm -hmm. on average, I think you know, it's not, I'm not, the, the figure isn't seared in my brain, but it's around 3,000, 4,000 for Chinook salmon. Wow. So yeah. It just, I, I'm trying to grasp that, yeah. you know. And, like, and every year we look at that, at that data, we take that data and then we have several years, we're looking yeah. at decades of data. You can see, and, and that's what allows the, the fisheries biologists to look at the data and they say, all right, well, the, 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 maybe the eggs, number of eggs per female has gone down over time, so maybe the condition of those fish are down. And that, they use some of that data, that information, to, to decide, well, maybe we should reduce the amount of stocking because the condition factor of the fish is not as good. So there's all much, so, only so much food to eat. If we have too many mouths to feed, the fish don't get as big. Got it. Okay, now there's another question that, <laughs> this is, folks, this is awesome, by the way. <laughs> Um, how do these fish know to come up the river? All right, because I'm sure that's a big question. So these are these are Pacific salmon, but Atlantic salmon would be the, the yeah. same thing. And we do stock Atlantic salmon into the system, but they're not raised here. Okay. Um, most salmon that are born in or hatched in uh, fresh water and and travel to most salmon travel to the ocean. But right. we don't right. have the ocean here. We have Lake Ontario as the ocean. Um, most of the of the imprinting, if you will, the, the, mm -hmm. the figuring out where they want to be, is done is done when they're in eggs and then when they're small fry or when they're small, you know, uh, fingerlings, and they reach a point. They 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 spend their initial part of their life in the fresh water, and they they key in on the different chemical makeup of that stream, oh. the, the amino acids, the, the salinity, all those different things. I don't know that they know exactly what they use. I think it's a combination mm -hmm. of things, mm -hmm. um, but that water that they, that they live in as, when they're young is, is, has a, uh, for lack of a better term, flavor. Right. That, that somehow right. They, can, they can key in on. And uh, it, they, they, when, they, when they get to a certain size, their bodies change. Physio physiologically, right. they change. And uh, if they were going to the ocean, they would be able to, to live in salt water. These right. fish don't go to the ocean. Um, but they change. They, they smolt. They change their shape mm -hmm. and they change mm -hmm. their color. And then they swim out of their, of their natal streams and they go into the ocean or into the lake. And they, they live their lives out there until they're ready to spawn. So the king salmon are... And I've, always, I've fished for kings many times, like Michigan and all that. Um, are they four-year-olds? Is that what it is? Or is it a, a three-year-old? It's a, a mix. Okay. Kings are usually twos, threes, and a few fours. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And then what happens after you harvest the eggs? We all know that they're dying, yes, right? Yes, they die. So what ends up happening with the fish here that you guys take and you take the eggs and i watched a few videos you guys got some phenomenal videos folks if you're ever looking for a video to watch about the salmon fish hatchery check out their videos um 
uh, what uh, uh, happens to those fish? So the fish come into the come into the system. The, the fish that we bring into the spawn house, we take we take the eggs from them and they're euthanized. Yeah. And those 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 carcasses get um, composted. Oh. So That's we have even we yet. have we have three large comp or two large compost pits, mm -hmm. large compost pits, right. and we just layer them with uh, wood chips. Okay. And their bodies decompose very quickly, and mm -hmm. we have basically we just use every other year, and we clean them out, and it makes a nice, uh, rich compost that we freely give away or or use or whatever. Just a wow. they make a nice compost. See that? Who would ever know that if I did not ask that question? <laughs> Outdoor secrets unwrapped. <laughs> so um. And then pretty much it's the same for steelhead that you collect eggs and all, but you release them back That's into That's right. Them. The steelhead don't die when they spawn mm -hmm. um, or after they spawn. And um, they, they do get anesthetized though. So that an anesthesia that we use has a very short cooling off period, mm -hmm. maybe three to five days. So we hold them in outside in, in large ponds. Um, really just concrete raceways that are connected to the system. They're connected right. to the fish ladder that they came up in. And we hold them in there for a few days, maybe a week or two, and we release them when, when we're done with them. It's a short process. The steelhead egg take only takes about a week. Okay. And, um, and things don't really change much in that week, so we leave them in those ponds to, to not, we don't open the ponds to the, to the main system because the main system has lots more fish in it that we didn't use. Right. So instead of releasing the fish, all we would be doing is letting the the other fish into the ponds that they're so we kind of hold them a little bit and then once things calm down a little bit and we get some free time we'll, we'll we push them all back into the fish ladder and they're out there's still fish out in the fish ladder wow now, so. and then um temperature the water temperature how do they know to come up into the streams well most everything is it is triggered by photo period okay. and then they wait for temperature uh we have protocols that we use to take eggs that uh, we have to abide. We 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 determine that taking eggs above outside of that temperature range or uh, temperature would it doesn't doesn't make for quality eggs. Ah. So with Chinook eggs, they, we like to take our eggs below 58 degrees. Okay. And we've realized over the years, uh, after you know using science to look at at, at different uh, uh, hatch rates and yeah. things like that over the years, um, that under 55 degrees is really ideal for cohos. Wow. Steelhead are a little bit different and that you really when things are changing in the spring It's kind of tough. Sometimes we've taken yeah. eggs when it was 33 degrees and yeah. this year We took eggs when it was 39 degrees So it's it doesn't necessarily it's more of a logistics thing and they can mm -hmm. usually we it's a little bit Maybe a maybe a little bit of voodoo science sometimes with the steelhead, but everything worked out really well this year All right, know. great. Let's um, maybe we can walk around see some stuff here Absolutely. at the hatchery Absolutely. and then, um, We'll go from there, right? All right, folks, hang tight. We're going to be back with more from the Salmon Fish Hatchery here in Pulaski, New York, right after. Stay tuned for your Outdoor Tip of the Week. Welcome back to Outdoor Secrets Unwrapped. I'm Dale Helgeson with your Outdoor Tip of the Week. Today we're going to talk about tying just a simple knot. I use this knot for most of my knots. So if I pretend this is the eyelid of a hook or a jig or a whatever you're tying on, it could be a snap, and this is my line, just to make it easy to see. Um, all you do for, I'm going to teach you how to do a polymer knot. So you just put it through the eyelet, stick it back through the eyelet. So now you have the tag end and your line going to your rod out that end. And you have a loop out the other end. So what you do is I, I hang on to the bait or whatever you're going to tie to in this tag end. And then I take this loop and you actually just tie it, a, a, just a straight and single knot around your line, right? 
So you tie that, pull that tight, and then you actually take the loop and you have to hang on to this tag end. And you stick your jig or bait or whatever through that loop. And when you tie that down and cinch it up, this knot, it, it doesn't break. So I'm going to show you on a rod now. So this is just some fluorocarbon. I'm going to tie on a big jig. So you just stick it through the eye, stick it back through the eye, and grab that tag end. So I hang on to the tag end and the bait. So now I have the loop, and you just tie an overhand knot around your line going to your rod, and I cinch that down to the, the eye, and then you have this big loop, and then you just open that loop up, but hang on to the tag end with the other hand, and pull that bait through, and when you tighten that up, wet your knot down, but that knot does not break. It's a quick, easy knot, yet it's very strong. So I hope that'll help you tie your hooks on so you lose less baits. And stay tuned for more, and that is your Outdoor Tip Pretty of the Week. Tiffany with S2S Outdoors. Outdoors. You are watching Outdoor Secrets on the Rack. Welcome back to Outdoor Secrets Unwrapped. I'm your host, Chris Bates. We're outside here at the fish hatchery here in Salmon and Flasky. What are we doing right now? So today we're stocking some steelhead uh -huh. that are going to go into Lake Ontario. Um, we're going to load this truck with a fish pump, electric fish pump. Okay. So basically what happens here is this fellow's going to get in this pond uh -huh. and he's going to crowd these fish up into this section. And then this this bell will someone will activate will open that bell up and they'll see the fish will come in and through and they'll pump water and fish up into this tower and then they'll dewater the fish as they go. Okay. And then they'll go into the tank. Right. And if you look at the gauges that are on the tank, those little gray devices with the bubble on them. Yeah. So those gauges were developed in New York fish culture. And they are designed to show that, so everything in fish culture is done in fish per pound in New York State. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Other places do grams per fish, they do right. metric, but we, do, we still do fish per pound. So if we know what the, the fish have been sampled in the tank already, so we know that the average, what the average fish per pound is. So maybe let's say these fish are five to the pound. Okay. Okay, so then what we know with those gauges is, is that those gauges work that every 80 pounds of fish raises the, the gauge one inch. Okay. Water, one inch on the gauge. Okay. So they can, we can extrapolate, we say, all right, our fish weigh this much, or they're just made to a pound, we need, we need this many fish, so we need this many pounds, and we can convert that to inches. Got it. And then we can spread those inches out across a, 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 a truck. Okay, so where are we at now in this in the fish hatchery? So this is the hatchery's new fish ladder. Was, you can see some parts are, are have, have been rebuilt. Yeah. Um, it's a few. It's a, it's about a, two years old. Um, so this is the place where the salmon and the steelhead, depending on you know the time of year. Yeah. Obviously, this is springtime, and this is when the steelhead come up. The steelhead will come in right behind the salmon. They'll start to come in. So in the fall, they'll actually see steelhead in the ladder as right. the salmon are coming out and, and coming out of the system. Yeah. They'll often come in to feed on the, the steelhead yeah. eggs. Yeah. Those fish will spend the winter in and out of this. They have they can come and go as they please. Because our water is, is has a lot of well water in it, it's a little bit warmer. They uh, often will, will yeah. set up in here. So this, yeah. the, right now we have some, le this whole system goes into Beaver Dam Brook. And then Beaver Dam Brook, just a short uh, spell down the down the in the woods, goes into main, into the main salmon river. Which okay, we are in the what room? Egg incubation area. Okay. Okay? So once, once those eggs are, are treated with diamond and they're disinfected, then they would come over into this, this area. And they come over, it takes them a while to water harden and everything. Yeah. So it's not, yeah. it's not something that happens you know, in, in 15 minutes. 
So darn it, why not? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. And it's because we do a large amount of salmon. Often we'll do four to five million eggs. Wow. So I was going to ask that four to five million, million eggs. Million eggs. Yes. Wow. Depending on the year, and every year is yeah, just slightly yeah. different. So these these are steelhead eggs okay. from the springtime, okay. and because we don't take as many, and it's ju it's just as easy to. So what would happen with those eggs after we after we shocked them and picked them the salmon? Yeah. Yeah. We would re we would tray them into these eggs because they're easier to care for. Got it. But as steelhead, they're easy to care for. We don't have as, as many. So so these eggs are almost eyed up. They're almost ready to go. Next week they'll probably start eyeing up. You can probably. Open that for you if you can and get you have a, a little better look. Oh, I see. Oh, wow. I'll actually, yeah. I'll actually steal a couple. Okay, let me. Uh... And you can see that the that the, the, the bad egg there is let white. Me... Yeah. Let me just get it. Okay. Wow. So how many eggs does this hold? Uh, uh, it, give or take. It depends, but they usually put. This is, they usually put about two and a half quarts in there. Oh, okay. 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 It depends on the size of the egg. It depends on the species. Yeah. Um, I don't know how many eggs are, we're in a, in a quart with each this year, but yeah, you know there'll be. There's, there's a lot. A, of there's eggs. about two million <laughs> eggs here, and there's three. There's there's almost three batteries full. Wow. So. All right, hang tight. We're gonna be back with more. Where are we now? So. Once the eggs hatch, yeah. they spend some time in the incubators, and then when they absorb their yolk sac and they're ready to start swimming up, inflating their air bladders and feeding, yep. then they're brought into the start tank room. Ah. And this area is where most of the fish spend most of their time. Okay. So right now we're in the when it's springtime, so we're stocking Chinooks um, and cohos and steel. What's in this tank? Is the these are the the Chinooks. That were taken I mean, this October, and th so this October, so what was that? Uh, four months, five months ago, five six months ago. Five so months that's ago. how old they are. So they get fed right here, uh, fish food, and it's really it's small. extruded. It, it's, it changes with the size of the fish, of course. Right, right. We use a very very small a, a very very small mash to start with when, the, when they're very small and their mouth parts are small, and then it graduates up as they get All right, big. Folks, we'll be back. <laughs> Unwrapped. I'm your host, Chris Bates. Boy, what a educational trip I took through the fish hatchery with you. Um, first off, I want to say thank you very much for spending time with us. You're very welcome. It's awesome. New York has, um, I'm going to say New York State has a really top quality facility, top quality personnel, everybody, and you, top quality. <laughs> thank you. But, um, you know, some of the things about the fish hatchery, where you may or may not be able to answer this, but you know, where do you see this going for the next 10 years? I, I you know, I, I usually like 10 year cycles because you know, things are going to change, but do you see it getting bigger and better? Do you see it staying the same? Like, where do you see it as a manager of a facility like this? Well, we've put a, a large amount of, of, of money and effort into. into improving this facility i don't see that as changing mm -hmm. um i think uh fish culture in general is in, in new york is is going to see some really neat improvements some really interesting changes uh there's some projects going on that are going right. to maybe change the landscape a little bit i think the 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 big driver of this fish hatchery the chinook fishery is, is seems to be leaning more towards a supplement we're, we're, we're supplementing a a natural fishery that seems to be showing up more and more right. there's more and more natural reproduction in these places which is a good thing it's it says that the environment supports that natural reproduction uh -huh. so it's a challenge for managers to do that but i don't see this facility going anywhere anytime soon um there's a lot of of infrastructure in all facilities that always needs work uh i think that our new york's commitment to this facility is strong uh, there's a good uh, uh, pool of money that's being spent mm -hmm. at this facility, mm -hmm. and uh, there's projects that go out several years that we're we're going to be working on, and um, 
We're always trying to improve our methods. We're always trying to, uh, to do the, the, the right thing uh, for the sportsmen and women that, that, that support us. And we take our job, as you can tell, very seriously. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and you know, you guys are open. You have a wonderful welcome center. I guess it's called the Welcome Center, right? So we consider it our visitor center, but yeah, yeah. anyway. And, yeah, and we're going to get some footage of this when we're done. But, um, you know, how many visitors do you know off the top of your head that possibly come through this facility? Um, it's Obviously, it's a slow time because it's right. spring time. But, yeah, we, we can get uh, probably... Between 30 and 50,000 visitors come through this place a year. Wow, that's oftentimes in the fall when the salmon run is going on, and uh, everybody wants to come see the big fish and see yeah. the, the egg take. We'll get almost uh, almost 2,000 visitors a day. Yeah, they come through this place. So I was looking at one of the videos. Is there a wall that's buttoned right up against the river, like a glass wall, or is that a different fish entry? Uh, there's it not. A, a, yeah, it might be yeah, a different fish. Be, you can walk down. To our, our yeah. uh, uh, the, at the end of the fish ladder, there's a viewing platform. Yeah. Um, but it's but it's there's no place that you can get down yeah. into the river. No, that, not at this. It was a different no. fish yeah. But all right. Well, thank you so much for everything. You're very This welcome. is a wonderful facility, and folks, if you ever are in Pulaski, New York, stop by the fish hatchery. Say hi to Thomas for me, will you, please? <laughs> all right. Thank you for everything. You're welcome. All right, folks. We'll be back with another episode next week. Outdoor Secrets Unwrapped is brought to you in part by White Rocks Design Studio at Turcotte Design, who has been serving Southern Vermont for over 20 years. Fish Donkey, the future of tournament fishing, Targets Unlimited, Mercer Sports. Outdoor Secrets Unwrapped hot sauce with that big craft heat and that big craft taste. Corker Boots, P-Line, Sugar Mountain Trading Company. The Outdoor Experience Guide Service, who has been serving Southern Wisconsin for over 20 years. Cooler Guard Spray with the cleaning Power of Enzymes, Okuma Fishing, Hoffman Lures Incorporated, and a proud member of the Southwest Chamber of Commerce. We'll meet you again. May God bless you. Adios. Wise men say, holy fools, only fools are shame. But I'm hacking and falling in love. Mm -hmm.